really celebrate and, and to appreciate because uh, while I love everything that we're doing with the church, I can honestly get into one of those modes. I can be one of those task-oriented people. We go from one thing to another thing to another thing to another thing. We got to do this, got to do this, got to do this. And then sometimes we just need to sit back uh, to take the time to really appreciate and to really stop and to thank God for the many blessings that we have in our lives. How many of you really, you don't have to raise your hand, this may be one of those rhetorical, but you can answer inwardly, um, how many of you are really thankful people? Some of you really are, and some of you are really gifted at it, and you're very sweet, and you're very genuine, and you're always thinking of other people, and when people do something for you, you are one of those ones that are always thanking them. Honestly, I didn't grow up that way. I was just always looking for the next thing that was coming down the line. And if somebody did something nice, it was great. But there were six other things that I was focused on at the time. And so as I've gotten older and more mature, I've tried to take the time to just slow down uh, every once in a while and just say, thank you. On the count of three, let's all say thank you. One, two, three. Thank you. Wouldn't the world be a kinder place if we spent more time just saying thank you to people and to really appreciating? Uh, I know it's busy time in the stores and it's frustrating and there's lines and all that kind of stuff, but, but just go out of your way to say to the clerk or those who are helping, those who are assisting, those who are at the return counter, God bless them. And just thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. Thank you for what you do. Um, I have to admit that sometimes uh, we can be very thankful in this season, uh, even if it's a little bit flippant. How many of you have circled the parking lot at the mall or the store and you're thinking, I'm going to have to park way out because there's so many cars and then suddenly a little old lady pulls out of the front spot and it's not even a handicap and you're like, yes! And do you not lift your eyes to heaven and just say, thank you, Jesus, right? You know, just, just thank you for the parking spot. Thank you for that great spot. Or maybe when you come up and you're at Walmart on Black Friday and you're thinking, I've got what I need. I just need to get out of here and you walk up and there's no lines, no waiting and there's a smiling clerk waiting to help you at the cash register and you just look up to God and go, thank you Jesus. <laughs> you know? Yeah, or maybe you got this really great deal on Black Friday. You got 60% off and you're just so excited about it and you, you lift your eyes to heaven and go, thank you Jesus. But what I want to ask you is sometimes if we're not careful, then our theology could slip because if we don't get that front space, if we do have to wait in line for 30 minutes, if we have to park way out back, if we didn't get the deal because the lady in front of us got the last one, does it work the other way as well? We have a tendency to, for everything that's good, and we should do this, everything that's good comes from God. But everything that's not good smells like smoke and comes straight from the pit of hell, right? You know, we, we've got to keep our theology straight with that. But sometimes, I even have to admit that I slip in my little flippant theology sometimes. Um, many of you know that I, I do ride a motorcycle. It is the only vehicle I have. And during this rainy season of the summer, people are always asking me things like, well, what do you do when it rains? I was like, get wet? <laughs> <laughs> you know, wouldn't it be great if you just, you know, it's storming and then you, there goes Pastor Greg on his way to visitation at the hospital or the nursing home and, and it's raining everywhere else, but there's a little bubble of sunshine that just went <laughs> everywhere that he went. Wouldn't that be awesome? I think that would be awesome, you know, but the fact is when it rains, I get wet. But during uh, this rainy season, what I would do, because most of my path is either between here and Oak Hill. I don't know why. I send us a lot of time over in Oak Hill. All right. But there's two ways you can go. You can either go up Mariner or you can go up Deltona. And literally, I look at the radar and say, where are the rain clouds coming from? Uh, because it's not a, one of those blanket rains that's everywhere. It's always this little thunder cloud. And it's either one or the other. And so I have to figure out if I have time to go one way. If it hasn't arrived yet, then, then I'm going to go at Deltona because it's already probably raining on Mariner. And if I get to the hospital and I'm still dry and I walk inside, I lift my eyes to heaven and go, thank Thank you, Jesus, right? And, but if it's raining, it's already past Mariner, and it's over on Deltona, then I'll just go up Mariner. I get there dry, 
thank you, Jesus. And I will tell you that it usually works out. But one day, not too long ago, um, my theology was challenged because I was riding home from Oak Hill, back here to church, bright sunshine, and it rained on me the whole way. And I have to just be honest and admit, I really did look up to heaven and go, seriously? It's like, come on. You know, sometimes we have this little flippant theology, but, but God reminded me of the scripture where Jesus says, God allows it to rain on the just and the unjust. Not proclaiming which one of those I am. I'm just saying, maybe, just maybe, our blessings from God are a little bit deeper than whether or not we get wet in the rain. Sometimes our spiritual and emotional lives are intertwined. When, when we say to Christians, you know, how are you doing? Well, it's a good day. Well, it's a bad day. There are things that are going on inside of our lives. And, and sometimes they are so intertwined that we can't separate the two. And we think somehow one has to do with the other. And uh, when things are going well, we're on this emotional roller coaster. We're on the high of highs. And, and when things are going well in our lives, then we say, God loves us. And then we go into a steep dive and say, God must be mad. He must be angry. I must have sinned. I, mu he, I must have cursed him somehow, and now he's cursing me. And so just as our lives go, we stay on this emotional roller coaster of our spiritual lives as well. How many of you would like to have, you don't have to raise your hand, but just inwardly, how many of you would like to have a more consistent spiritual life? One that doesn't ebb and flow with every circumstantial whim of the day. Well, today we're going to be taking a look in the Psalms. And as you have your Bibles and you would want to start looking there, it will be up here on the screen if you don't have it. I was uh, preparing for this message and, and I was doing some research and I came across an interview um, with Eugene Peterson. Many of you know Eugene Peterson. Uh, he did the commentary on uh, the New Testament called The Message. So many people know him from that. He's also a pastor and he's authored many books along the way. Well, one of his fans is the lead singer from U2, Bono. Uh, many people don't know that Bono is a Christian, but he's more of what I call a reluctant Christian because he loves Jesus, but he's you know, disappointed often in the followers of Jesus. And so he's kind of a reluctant Jesus or a reluctant Christian, a reluctant follower, but he loves Jesus and he loves Eugene Peterson. And so Bono reached out to Eugene Peterson's people and said, I would like to have an interview with Eugene Peterson. I would love to just sit down and talk with him sometime. And uh, Eugene Peterson, I guess he was busy because his people said, um, Bono from U2 would like to sit down and have a talk with you. And Eugene said, no. <laughs> and, and later they are doing the interview and the interviewer said to Eugene Peterson, you might be the only person in the world that would turn down a personal face-to-face -face visit with Bono from U2. But they came together, and the thing that really brought them together was the Psalms. And they are, and one of the reasons that, that Bono doesn't like to admit he's a Christian is because sometimes the Christians aren't real. Sometimes they're not honest with their emotions, and sometimes they just try to Pollyanna their way through life and just, everything's okay, everything's going on when it's not really going okay. And Bono just wants everybody just to be authentic, just to be legitimate, just to be real. If you're mad, be mad. If you're not, don't, you know. And he just said, but one of the things that he loves is the Psalms. If you haven't been in the Psalms lately, I encourage you. Uh, a psalm a day will keep Satan away. All right? uh, that's, that's like a God doctor phrase, okay? You know, it's like, yeah, a psalm a day. When you get into the Psalms, now the Psalms are written by real people to an almighty God. 
And one of the things that's happened in Christianity over the last hundred years or so, many churches have taken the emotion out of our worship services. And, and we just, we come and, and in fact, one of my uh, favorite stories is from Tony Campolo. Many of you know him. He's a very fiery preacher. And he was teaching in a seminary and he, and he went to a church one time and he took some of his seminary students. And maybe you've been to those churches before where the pastor stands up and said, let us enter his courts with thanksgiving in our hearts. Let us enter his courts with praise. And with that, then, then Tony Campolo and all of his students stood up and went, Woo! 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 <laughs> he says, we didn't realize he didn't really mean it. Some of us grew up in churches where we folded our hands and we were to be very quiet. And we were, some of us have been in churches where we got scolded for clapping for the choir. And you've noticed I've never done that. I think we need to show appreciation. I think we need to be real. I think we need to, to feel. I think we need to love. And, and when you get into the Psalms and you see all the real and the raw emotions of real people writing their heart out, pouring out their prayers and psalms and praises to a holy God. However, our faith should not be based upon our circumstances. It should be based upon our internal security. And we're going to talk about the difference for those in just a moment. Let's take a look now as we take a look at Psalm 100. The psalmist writes, shout for joy. Somebody shout. Yay! Oh, we even got some of y'all to shout. I knew y'all would come through. You guys come through every week. But even some of y'all get excited. It's okay to shout unto the Lord. Actually, one of the contemporary songs from probably 20 years ago, which maybe it's not contemporary anymore, is Shout to the Lord. And I've never understood it. Because it's shout to the Lord. That's like, that's not shouting. This is shouting. If you're going to shout, Shout. The psalmist says, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. I keep telling everybody, I am convinced that there are people who are not in church today because they would rather laugh with the sinners than cry with the saints. They think we're in here crying. We need to show them difference. We need to say, woohoo, it's a church day. I get to go worship God. I get to be with my friends and my family. And, and we get to learn and we get to grow. But we get to send our praise up to God. God, we can shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. How many people out there would be in here if we were true people of joy that we would get so excited about what God has done and what is doing and will do in our lives that we would enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise and we would shout for joy to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Worship, verse 2. This is going to be a long sermon. Worship the Lord with gladness. We should be overflowing with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. No. Now, this isn't just no. This is no. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his. The scripture says that we are not our own. We belong to somebody else. We can't just do whatever we want to do because God loves us so much that he sent his one and only son who died on the cross for our sins so that we could be washed clean, so that we could be forgiven. And so we then turn around and live blessed lives for him. We are not our own. We, the world is out there seeking after happiness. And we are called to say, no, we follow somebody who has shown us the way to the abundant life. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his thanks with, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise and give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good and his love endures forever. It's one of the things that we as preachers spend most of our time 
pounding on the pulpit and preaching and trying to get across to people is we focus so much on this life and we treat the other as just fire insurance. And what we're really supposed to be doing is looking for the eternal life and being grateful for what God is doing for us in the future and not paying as near as much attention to our circumstances of the day. Not running on that roller coaster of ups and downs spiritually as our emotions and our circumstances do. But for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. And uh, this may be good news or bad news. Turn to somebody and say, I'm going to be here forever. (laughs) I'm going to endure forever. (laughs) Some of you think that may be heaven and some of you are thinking this could be hell. I I don't know. But God's love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all the generations. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All right, so let's take a look at it. If we could be more like the psalmist, if we could get emotional, um, many of the contemporary churches are moving that way because people are tired of being bound. They're tired of being tied up and just sitting still. And if you're in this service, I want you to know that you are invited to worship God with your whole heart and with your whole being. Um, Try not to do cartwheels down the aisle. Um, It is a safety hazard. But you know what I'm getting at. You know that the idea there is that we are truly joyful to the Lord. We can use all of our emotions. Listen to the descriptive words of the psalmist. Shout, worship with gladness, know that the Lord is good, and enter his courts with thanksgiving in our hearts. Does that mean that things are always rosy? I beg your pardon. Thank you for that. (laughs) Many of you know the old song. I never promised you a rose garden, right? And sometimes we we think that if we're Christians, then God should take care of us. He should protect us and nothing should ever go bad and it shouldn't rain on us anywhere we go. And the fact is, that's not true. True. And the fact is, the bad news is when you become a Christian, many times life gets harder because you can't enjoy doing the things that you used to enjoy doing because you know it's bad, you know it's not good, you know it's harmful. And sometimes it separates you from family, sometimes it separates you from friends. Things are not always going to be rosy. But remember, Jesus said, if they hate you, remember that they hated me first. It wasn't all peaches for the disciples uh, for Jesus. In my devotions this week, how many of you have ever read Oswald Chambers and uh, My Utmost for His Highest? A number of you uh, probably have that one. If you have it in your library and you haven't gotten it out in a long time, get it back out because this guy is awesome. I'm telling you, the, the devotions are only about this big, but it'll take you 30 minutes to get through it because they are deep. And as I was going through my devotions this week, I came across this, that Oswald Chambers noted that the Apostle Paul had learned the secret of contentment. How do we know that? Because in Philippians, he tells us that he has learned to be content in all situations. But here's the secret of contentment. He kept his internal life separate from his external life. You get that? All the stuff, whether good or bad, doesn't affect our internal life with Jesus Christ. We, we can have that peace that passes all understanding when everything else around us is in chaos. In fact, we want to be the kind of people when things are going really bad for us and we're still smiling and we're still praising God and we're still being joyful and people are like, how can you praise God with what you're going through? Said, you know, easy. Easy. My Lord and my Savior, Jesus, went through way harder than this. This is nothing. I know my my security comes and it lies with my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. All this stuff, it's just stuff. Remember that? Don't sweat the small stuff and it's all small stuff. There's the things that we have to figure on and we shouldn't have to be on that emotional roller coaster and we certainly shouldn't tie it into our spiritual lives. He said he kept his internal life separate from his external life. The man, Paul, was beaten up and he praised God. What? Yeah, 
He was beaten up for preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Paul turned to his buddies and said, ain't it great? (laughs) I am counted worthy of suffering with my Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for his sake and for his glory. This is awesome. They beat him up and then they threw him in prison. They put him in shackles. You know what he did when he was in prison in shackles? He sang psalms. He sang hymns to God. God even gave him an earthquake and freed him. He didn't run away. But he saved the jailer who would have had to have killed himself. And he's just like, no, not going to do it. Not going to worry about it. Whether I'm in chains, whether I'm, you know, satisfied, whether I have want or plenty or nothing, you know, I, I still can find something to praise my God for. He counted it all joy. What the heck? How many of you look at the circumstances in your life and count it all joy? Can you look through the minefield of all the circumstances that are going on inside of your life and still find something to praise Jesus about? I also came across an article uh, written by a friend of mine. Uh, He's the Reverend Keith Boyette. Keith and I were in seminary together, and now he's the president of the Wesleyan Covenant Association. The Wesleyan Covenant Association is attempting to bring a sense of scriptural holiness uh, to the conversations taking place within the United Methodist Church. And Keith's article was in regard to the anxieties many feel about the future of the church. And uh, I want you to know that this morning that I'm not preaching at you Because as I was writing this sermon, I'm realizing I need this sermon as well. I'm not perfect. I'm not all that and a bag of chips. I'm on the journey with you. And I just have to admit, I've gone through a pretty tough season in the past month or so uh, about some emotional ups and downs, about some things that have been going on along the way. And yes, even admitting to anxieties in the Methodist church. And this was a timely article for me. In his article, Keith writes about the character and the founder of the Methodist Church, John Wesley. And in his journal, John writes this. On June 28, 1773, just a few years ago, John Wesley wrote in his journal, I am 73 and far abler to preach than when I was three and 20. <laughs> and those of us who've been preaching for a long time, we think back some of those early churches and those early sermons and say, God bless you all, <laughs> you know. Um, but John admits, I'm in a much different place at 73 than I was at 23. And what natural means has God used to produce so wonderful an effect? As Wesley concluded his entry, he observed, may I add lastly, evenness of temper. Has anyone accused you recently of having evenness of temper? I would say they have not for me. That's for sure. In fact, I always tell people that I'm like the Hulk. And I'm not bragging in any certain way because it's not a good thing. But I can just take it and take it and take it and take it. But I keep telling people, you won't like me when I'm angry. (laughs) You know, and I will just, you know, just go crazy. Um... And, and that's not the way that we're supposed to be. Did I, what, did I get an amen? No. All right. Uh, but anyway, that's not the way that we're supposed to live. And, and listen to this about John Wesley. Um, in Nick Harrison, in his book, The Best of All, God is With Us, Heartwarming Devotions for the Life of John Wesley, observes, John Wesley refused to worry. What did Jesus say? about worry. (laughs) I had to finish the sentence because some of you are like, well, he said a lot. Which one do you want? What did he say about worry? He said, don't worry. How many of you are worriers? Yeah. And then we think sometimes there are some verses that we listen to and then there's some where we go, okay, well, that's Jesus, okay? He cannot worry. I'm human and I worry. But listen to this about John Wesley. It, It says that that John Wesley refused to worry. And he refused to become irate about anything. Simply put, he was unwilling that any negative emotion would rule his behavior. Wouldn't the world be a kinder and gentler place if we all took this attitude? We refuse to get irate. Yes, even wiping out road rage. 
right? The guy who cut you off or the one who took that last parking place and it was yours because you were sitting there with the blinker on. I can't believe it. John Wesley refused to worry. Don't worry. And he refused to become irate about anything. Simply put, he was unwilling that any negative emotion would rule his behavior. This trait was especially apparent during the many attacks upon his character and violence directed against him bodily. That means they beat him up. They, they, they wanted to harm him. They didn't want his style of preaching. In fact, um, a couple of years ago, Chris and I had the opportunity to go to London and, and to go to England and do the travels of John Wesley over there to see his childhood home. And only about two blocks from his childhood home was the church that his father had started and had preached in. And when John Wesley went back to preach there, they would not allow him in the doors because he was such a fiery preacher. Some of them just didn't want to hear the good news, bad news. And so they kept John Wesley out. And so they actually have a plaque that's been erected there because John Wesley's father's grave is just outside. It's above ground. And John Wesley, who was only about five foot two, jumped up on top of his father's grave and he preached to anybody and everybody that would just listen to him. John Wesley was not well liked in many of the towns that he went because of his fiery preaching. People had uh, directed their violence against him, even bodily. But listen to this. It says, in case after case, he rose to the occasion by refusing to allow adverse circumstances to alter his mood. He would not fret and he would not return anger for anger. How are you doing this morning? (laughs) Anybody accused you of being even-tempered lately? Anybody accused you of having the peace that passes all understanding despite your circumstances? Anybody ever ask you, why aren't you worried about this? Why aren't you fretting? Why aren't you getting angry about it? Wouldn't it be a great way for each and every one of us to live that no matter what's happening, we can still have the peace that passes all understanding. Why is it called the peace that passes all understanding? Because normal human beings can't understand why you're handling such difficult circumstances so well. We can have the internal peace, the shalom, the peace of God, despite all the chaos that's going outside around us. We keep, like the Apostle Paul, John Wesley, our internal security completely separate from our emotional and external circumstances. Let me share with you now uh, something many of you all know. Uh, you have it recorded. Some of you have it a uh, picture frame that's on your desk or maybe it's in your uh, card and your Bible or maybe a picture on the wall at home. It's called the serenity prayer. Because for those of you this morning who really need some peace and serenity because you're going through a lot, you're, there's some incredible circumstances that are testing you right now and the way that you respond to them. Listen to this prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. How many of you are old and mature enough to realize there are things in this world you cannot change? If you're married or children, you already know what I'm talking about, right? There are some things in this world you cannot change. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can. Sometimes there are things that should be done. Something needs to be done about it. And so we need the courage to do the things that we can. And the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time. What did Jesus say about tomorrow? He said, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries for its own. Just pay attention to today. Live one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time. And honestly, this is the heart of why I needed this sermon and why I wanted to do this sermon. Because we just roll from one thing to another thing to another thing, and all of it is good. But sometimes we don't take the time to really appreciate what's happening, what we have done, what we have accomplished. Many times I'm a task-oriented person, and I, once I finish one task, I'm just right on to the next one. But sometimes we need to stop and to learn 
just enjoy one moment at a time. When I say I love serving this church, I'm not kidding. That's not a line. It's just saying, man, we have so many awesome things that we're doing, whether it's the food pantry or the soup kitchen, whether it's the, the fall festival, whether it's the kids and the, and the Samaritan's Purse, or whether it's the, the foster families, or whether it's feeding those who are in need. I, you know, I love every single one of those things. And sometimes we need to just stop and say, we have an awesome church. We are doing some really incredible things. And we need to just take a moment to just really to enjoy and to appreciate that. Now, the next one's kind of hard. It says, accepting hardships as a pathway to peace. How many of you love hardships? No. In fact, we like easy ships. We don't like hardships. We want easy ships. We, we want everything to go well. But listen to what it says, accepting hardship as the pathway to peace. It didn't go easy for Jesus. I mean, as soon as he was baptized, the Spirit drove him out into the desert for a time of testing. No food, no water, fasting, and Satan attacking him. I'm like, what? Shouldn't the Holy Spirit just put the holy bubble around Jesus and just protect him the whole time? But Jesus was going through this time. He called it a baptism. He called it a, an experience. He called it a time of testing. But actually, it's during these hardships and, and, and a times of testing that we can learn to be a people of peace. Accepting hardships as the pathway to peace. Some of you are thinking right now, I am going to be a really peaceful person because I'm going through a lot. Taking this sinful world as it is. How many of you know we live in a sinful world? How many of you watch CNN, Fox News? Yeah, I mean, the news, any news, pick a news, any news. It just sometimes it's overwhelming. Sometimes I have to turn it off because it's so distressing that we live in such a sinful world. Is that taking this sinful world as it is and not as I would have it? Wow, we need to sit on that one for a little bit. Taking the sinful world as it is. When the sinful world acts sinfully, we shouldn't be surprised. It shouldn't upset us because they're just doing what comes normal to them. Taking the sinful world as it is and not as I would have it. Maybe if we, the Jesus people, showed them love and peace and understanding and joy and comfort and forgiveness, then maybe they too would come to be a part of the Jesus team. Amen? Trusting that he will make all things right. He being capitalized, meaning God. Trusting that he will make all things right if I will. This is conditional. If I will surrender to his will. That I may be reasonably happy in this life. Reasonably happy. There's a whole world out there that are seeking happiness. They're going after happiness for happiness sake. And they're going to say, I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this. And I'm going to do this. And it's going to make me happy. But it doesn't make them happy. So they have to go on to the next thing. And the next thing. And the next thing. And the next thing. Because that's what they're always doing is looking for something that's going to make them happy. And Jesus is, is saying, or through this, the, the artist is, is saying that I may be reasonably happy in this world. Can we understand that we are the people of God? We're the people of Jesus Christ. And, and that we are not our own. We can't do whatever we want to do. If you seek after happiness for the sake of happiness, you will never find it. But if you seek after Jesus Christ, you will going to find both. That I may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with him forever and the next. That's belief in the eschaton. You're now getting eschatology, uh, understanding that eventual the good of God will overwhelm the evil of the world. And God will take us to come with him, to be with him in a place of no more crying, no more sorrow, and no more pain. The things that are going on this life, they really are light and momentary afflictions. They really shouldn't affect us, and they certainly shouldn't touch our soul, and they shouldn't drag us down, and we shouldn't be surprised when those kind of things happen. And we do say no to certain things because we are a follower of Jesus Christ. And so when we say that, we just say, people say, how come you're so peaceful? How come you're so, so happy? How come you're so blessed? And you say, oh, this world is nothing. Let me tell you what Jesus Christ has done for me. 
me. I have my ticket punched for the next life, and I'm looking forward to that. And I'm going to spread his love and joy for as long as I live, but I know that I'm going to be with him, and I'm going to be supremely happy forever in the next world. Amen? Amen. A couple, couple weeks ago, um, I'm wrapping up here. God bless you all for that. Um, a couple weeks ago, uh, Phil, our lay leader here at the church, gave a great message. And it was about, you know, the attitude of gratitude. And um, he had a slide up there. And I don't know if many of you saw it. Uh, but it said, it is not happy people who are thankful. But thankful people who are happy. Do you get the difference? It's not happy people that are thankful but thankful people that are happy. Regardless of our circumstances, regardless of the things, regardless of the health concerns, regardless of the affliction, regardless of the guy down the street, regardless of any of those things, that we know whose we are. We know that we were bought for a price, and we know that we have our eternal security with our Heavenly Father forever and ever and ever. If we can be like that, we can truly be one of those people who live the blessed lives, like Paul, like Wesley. We can learn to separate our internal spiritual lives from our external circumstances. Then we too can learn to shout to the Lord, worship with gladness, know that he is God, enter his courts with thanksgiving, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. Amen?